Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Rasmussen Theater here in the beautiful National Museum of the American Indian. As you know, we're celebrating chocolate this weekend. We celebrate it at this time every year because we, try it, we tie it in with the calendar time of Valentine's Day because a lot of people give their sweethearts chocolate as a gift, as well as flowers or dinner or things like that. But we celebrate it at this time because we want to remind everybody that chocolate is a gift to the world from the indigenous peoples of Central America. And so there's an opportunity to learn all about this this weekend in many different programs. And the program you're about to see features our executive chef from our Mitzitam Cafe, Richard Hetzler, and he'll be sharing some of his experiences with being able to cook and use chocolate in various food and drink uh, meals that he creates, both in the cafe and that he's done before as well. We also have with us, just so you know, our live audience on the webcam watching us. So say hello to our friends watching us on computer. And we hope that you will enjoy the presentation today with Chef Richard. So please join me in welcoming Chef Richard Hetzler. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming today. Um, so we're going to be talking about the wonderful, wonderful thing called chocolate. Um, I like talking about, you know, in these demonstrations, you know, if we're going to be talking about, you know, how we can use chocolate in foods that aren't just in the, the application of using it as a sweet or a dessert. We want to be able to use chocolate as a savory dish as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through a few recipes. We're going to show you guys how you can use chocolate in other ways than just desserts. Um, and then talk about, you know, what is chocolate, where chocolate comes from, you know, some of the stories and the histories behind it, and then kind of how it, chocolate has evolved from what it was to what it is today and to kind of what we know as chocolate. And then we'll open it up and we can do a little discussion and talk about, you know, any questions that you have or anything like that that I might be able to answer. We're going to talk, we're going to make a few dishes for you today. Timing allowed, we're going to do a, first dish we're going to make is actually a seafood chowder. And then we're going to do a cocoa seared salmon and a chocolate bacon dust. So again, talking about, you know, being able to use it in a different, different aspect. So it's not just a sweet aspect. We're also going to do a grilled romaine salad with a white chocolate and a white chocolate aioli. So you saw up here just a second ago, for those of you who were here, I was roasting some garlic. And I was just roasting a little bit of garlic in a pan with just a little bit of oil. And we're going to use this to make the white chocolate aioli. And aioli is normally basically a roasted garlic mayonnaise. We're going to incorporate the white chocolate into it and make it a little bit more. We're also going to use a little bit of cocoa butter in it as well. And then we're going to do some white and dark hot chocolates. We're going to do a white hot chocolate. And then we're going to do a traditional Mexican hot chocolate. And then we're going to talk about some of the stuff that, that is hot chocolate. I have two sous chefs with me today. These are my daughters, actually. So they come and help me out on these. So it's Raven and Tara. So you guys want to say hi to everybody? We have Miriam Menker, who is my cafe manager that runs the Mitsutam and the Mitsutam Espresso up here as well, taking pictures. So, um, you know, let's talk about what is chocolate, where chocolate comes from. Who knows where chocolate comes from? Anybody? Mexico. That's, that's good. South and Central America. Actually, chocolate, the cacao plant actually grows right around the equator. So anywhere that's kind of right, in that, the, right around the equator, because they've got the perfect temperature and humidity to really let the cacao plant grow. Has anybody ever seen a real cacao plant? How, this one right here to the left, this is actually a real cacao plant. It doesn't have any seeds on it. Um, typically, the seeds on the cacao plant look like a large pod, depending on the, the plant. Some, some are a little smaller, some are larger. But it looks kind of like a large... Uh, almost like a pointy kind of pineapple kind of ripply thing like that. When you break it open, the inside of it is basically a white pulpy meal, and there's seeds inside of it. And the seed is what they actually make the, the cocoa from. It's what they use to make the cocoa powder. That's where we get our cocoa butter. And that's what eventually you, they use to make chocolate. So what happens is, is when they open those up, they break those open, they pull it out of that pulp, they lay it out, they dry them, and they ferment them. By fermenting them, they allow that acidity to come out, the natural acidity to come out in the beans. And then when they get done with that, they roast them. And this is kind of the end product. This is a roasted cocoa bean. And if you want, I'll give you a couple. You guys, you want to go down, you can pass a couple around, and these guys will start so everybody can kind of see them, you can smell them and feel them. And essentially what they do then, the process of making chocolate is unique in the sense that then from here, they extract what we call the cocoa butter. 
So this is, back, this is actual raw cocoa butter. So they extract the cocoa butter from here, and that gives them two separate products. This can then be ground up into you know, cocoa powder, which is what you normally see, depending if they do alkalized cocoa powder or just standard. And all that is is just balancing out the acidity that's in the cocoa bean itself or in the cocoa powder. And then what happens when they make chocolate is they now put all that stuff back together and they blend it, and they do different blends, and that's kind of what this represents. This is the, basically the raw cocoa bean that's had the, the butter extracted, and then you can look at these here, and you can see the different ratios that go back into it, and this is really all that makes up chocolate. You've got the, the cocoa bean itself, you've got the cocoa butter, you've got sugar, and you've got milk solids, you know, or basically dried milk powder, or depending on how they're making it, and that makes it up. And those ratios of how much cocoa powder to cocoa butter to everything else is what gives you your ratio on chocolate. So everybody's seen at the store where you go to, you buy a good chocolate and you'll see a 50%, you know, Valrona, or you'll see a 74%, or you'll see like an 80, 85% bittersweet. Well, that all that is, is the amount of cocoa that goes into the cocoa butter. So you can see like this one here, this would basically be, this would represent a, a basic milk chocolate. So you can see there's not a lot of chocolate to it. There's a lot of cocoa butter, milk solids, and then the sugar. This one here would be about a 50% or just under a little bit less than a 50% chocolate. So this way you get to see the different ratios. There's not a lot of the milk fat into it. And then this here would be like a, probably about a 74% bittersweet. You know, so you can see the amount of cocoa that goes into it to the actual sugar. And there, this one doesn't represent cocoa butter, but it'd be a small amount of cocoa butter that would go in there as well. And that's basically what they do. By doing that, they're able to control and add in and be able to manipulate and make the chocolate that they want and control price points. Anybody know what this one would be? White chocolate. Now, you guys know the interesting story that white chocolate isn't really chocolate, right? Did everybody know that? I hope I didn't burst anybody's bubble. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. You get to come up and cook with me next time then. So what it is is that in order for chocolate to be considered chocolate in the United States, it actually has to have cocoa powder in it. White chocolate contains no cocoa powder. So in, in the sense of the, the word, it's really not chocolate. What it is, it's a play on words. They use cocoa butter, they use milk fats and sugars to make it, but in reality, it's really not chocolate because it doesn't contain the, the famous ingredient that we all love, which is the cocoa, the cocoa pot itself. So it doesn't have any actual cocoa and it. it has cocoa powder. So that's kind of the backstory. You know, chocolate has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, Native Americans in the, the Mayans and the Incas have been cooking with it forever. You know, at one point it was traded for currency. They were actually using it to, as money. You know, they would take the cocoa beans in and they would use them, they would barter with them to trade for food. So there's a lot of backstories that go to it. What I've got up in front is a, one of our, is a Mexican pitcher. And then we have this funny looking tool right here. It looks almost like the little drum things you had as a kid where you could kind of go back and forth. This is called a molinino. And the traditional chocolates that Native Americans would have had were actually, they would do Mexican hot chocolate or, or chocolate. They would actually take the cocoa beans, they would grind them down in a, in a, in a, with a mocajete, which is basically a lava stone, make a cocoa powder out of it, and then basically put it in hot water. And then they would put this in the pot, and then we're going to do it later, and you're going you're gonna to go back and forth with it. And what that does is it, it froths it. It makes it nice and, and frothy. It, makes, it gives you like the, the foam lips. And the th thing was, the more foam you had, the better the chocolate was thought to be. So there's a lot of fun stories that go back and forth. In front up here, I've got just some different stuff that we use in the kitchen, you know, and different things that work well. This is a Mexican cinnamon, and I'll give you a couple of these that the, my assistants can pass around so everybody can kind of get a smell on them. This is Mexican cinnamon. So this is actually a different, different type. Most of the cinnamon we get is from India or, or Asia. Um, this is a little bit more pungent. You'll smell it. It's a little bit fresher. It's the bark off of the tree itself. We've got Mexican chocolate. So when we're talking about chocolates, you know, most of our chocolates here, this is about a, this is a 74% bittersweet chocolate that I have here, the little small coins. Um, we've got a white chocolate, and we've got the Mexican chocolate. And the nice thing about the Mexican chocolate is Mexican chocolate is more of an unrefined chocolate. It's got some cinnamon and some chili notes in it, and it really changes the complexity of what the chocolate is and how it works. 
We've also got some Arbol chilies up here. We've got cocoa butters. We've got the cocoa, the, the cocoa beans themselves. Um, and like I said, some white chocolate. So we're going to utilize all this today to make some dishes for you guys to try, both on the, the savory side and then, you know, with the hot chocolates and stuff a little more on the sweet side. Anybody got any questions about chocolate so far? Yes. It is made from the bean. Basically what they do is they do a, an extraction process or a spinning process where they get to pull out the butter. But in order for it to be actually considered chocolate, it has to actually have the actual cocoa in it. So it's a piece of it, but it's not the actual, the, the actual cocoa powder that, the, that it needs to be considered chocolate. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do first is we're going to work on our chowder. We're going to kind of show you guys, I've got a little bit of water going so we can melt some chocolate. And what we're going to do here is we're going to make our chowder first. I've got a few ingredients that we're going to use. Of course, flour and butter. So what we're going to do there is we're going to use that to make our roux. That's going to thicken our soup. And then the ingredients that are going to go into it. I've got some green peppers. I've got some potatoes. I've got some uh, Paseo peppers or the, the poblanos. That's probably enough potatoes. I've got celery and onions. And essentially what we do, we use a, what we call a mirepoix system as a chef. A mirepoix is basically a mixture of carrots, onions, and celery. So if you hear it on the cooking channels, that's the, that's the basis of what it is. I've got a few bay leaves. I've got a few of the corn cobs that we actually took off because we're going to use those in our stock to flavor it. And I've got a little bit of fish stock. So the fish stock we're going to use is our, is our broth for it. Um, you can buy, I don't know if you, I think you're pretty sure you could buy fish stock from, uh, from the stores. If not, you could use the, you know, the regular chicken stocks and stuff like that. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take a little bit of our butter and I just want to melt that down. Now we're going to make what we call a roux. A roux in cooking is very simple. It's basically equal parts flour and butter. So that's the basic premise of a roux. Not a lot else that goes into it. The two ingredients, and then what you need to do is, once you get the butter melted down, you need to cook it for about five minutes. Now there's different stages of roux. Um, if anybody's ever eaten a lot of Cajun or Creole cooking, a lot of their roux are brown roux. And all that is is just cooking that roux to where it actually changes the color of it. And it actually starts to get almost like a burnt kind of nutty flavor from, from, from just from cooking it down. So now that we've got our butter just about melted, it's probably about four tablespoons. Again, it'll probably be about four tablespoons of flour. Because um, we do it so much, a lot of what we do, we just end up eyeing it. It's just, you know, as a chef, you know, and, and cooking in general, you know, a lot of what we do is basically just is the premises done off of uh, just eyeing up our foods, and, and really it's not a science. Now, when we get into the baking portion of what we do, there's a lot more science involved. You've got to have enough eggs for leavening. You've got to have enough flour to make sure that it, it has enough body and structure and stuff to be able to hold itself. So now, once this gets done, and you can make this ahead of time, keep this in your refrigerator, and you can pull it out as you need it, so this way you're not making it every time you have to make a soup, stew, chowder, or you know, if you want it to thicken up a sauce, you can actually have this done. It'll hold for you know, a number of weeks in, the, uh, in your refrigerator and stuff like that. So it'll actually, it, it'll, it works pretty well. So what you're looking for, this is a blonde roux here. And as you can see how it kind of it, it falls in on itself. We've got enough time in the cooking of it. I'm going to set this to the side so we can start working on our soup itself. Okay. Um, so that helps. <laughs> so... On our soup itself, I'm going to do just a touch more butter in here because I'm going to saute off all our vegetables. And again, we've got our onions, we've got our celery, we've got our potatoes, peppers. Now what we do when we're doing also cooking is we also look at cooking times of things. So certain items take longer to cook and we need that and we want those flavors to get built to build up in our soups and our stocks. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with our onions and our celery. We're going to cook those down a little bit first. I'll throw in my bay leaves and then a little bit of garlic to get started. And then from there, we'll add in our other ingredients. And we're, we're going to start just sauteing them off fairly slowly. So I've got about five cloves of garlic here. We're just going to smash those up. I'm 
and just give those a quick chop. And we're not looking for anything, you know, even on the garlic, it doesn't have to be super fine. It's, fine. it's okay if it's a little bit chunky. We just don't want to have whole big pieces of garlic because it's never good to, to bite into a whole big piece of garlic. All right, so we'll go, our garlic will go in there. And I'm going to throw in my onions and my celery. Peppers. So I've got green peppers and poblano peppers. And again, we're just using that because we want to build those different flavors. I got a little bit of bay leaf that's going to go in there. And then we're basically just going to saute this off. Now while I'm sauteing this off, you know, we want to add in a little bit of, we want to try to get some of those chocolate flavors into it and get some kind of undernotes. You know, baking or cooking, in a sense, is really just about building flavors. As chefs, that's all we do. We figure out what flavors work well together, and then we build off of them. So, you know, again, we're using this, to, we're going to be flavoring this with some chocolate and stuff like that. So we want to get some, I'm going to take a few of these cocoa nibs, or the cocoa pods, and I'm going to break them open. And then I'm just going to give them a quick chop. And I'm going to put those in there as well. So what those are, these raw cocoa beans are going to do is really give us a little bit of that underlying cocoa flavor. You know, but it's not going to be anything that's overpowering. It's going to be one of those very subtle, subtle tastes. You see, it's probably about, you know, maybe two tablespoons, three tablespoons of those cocoa beans that go right into there. And now this thing's getting nice and... Now we're getting a nice saute going. And what these will do is they'll actually start to release some of those oils that are left in those beans. And it'll help, like I said, it'll help to flavor our soup or our dish. It's really a very simple, simple dish. Most soups and stews, you know, the longer you can cook them, of course, the more flavor you're going to get from them. But they really work well in the sense that you can make them fairly quickly if you need to. This is going to saute probably for about five to seven minutes until the onions turn translucent. Um, for speed of service, we're going to go, we'll let it go for just a, just a touch longer, and then we'll speed it, and then we'll, uh, we'll add in our, our um, raw corn, and we're going to add in our potatoes and our stock, and then we're going to let that come up. Now what you could do, where I kind of built that roux on the side, and I showed you that roux, now what you could do, one of you guys want to just grab a towel and clean that out for me? Just be careful because it's warm. So just put it into a bowl. Um, what you can do is if you're making a small amount of soup, you could actually build a roux right into your pot. And I'll show you that as well on this one. We could turn around and then we're going to add just a little bit more butter. Butter is always your friend in the kitchen. I don't care what anybody says. You never trust a skinny chef. So basically what we're going to do, <laughs> what we're going to do here. We're going to let that butter melt down. We're going to do the same premise that we did earlier with, that, with the flour and the butter. We're going to build a roux right into the pot. Um, and then from here, we'll add in all the rest of our ingredients, and we're going to let it cook down. So now we've got that butter just about melted down. I'm going to take a little bit of my flour. And we can even add a little bit of our cocoa butter if we want, because really, a roux is flour and fat. So it's really, it could be any kind of, anything you wanted. If you had vegetable oil at your house, if you wanted to do something a little more low calorie, for those of you who don't like all the butter, you could use vegetable oil and make a roux off of it that way. It doesn't have to be made with 100% of butter or anything like that. As long as it's, it's any kind of, you know, flour and fat, equal parts. So if it's, you know, if it's one cup of flour, then it's one cup of oil, basically, is what you want to use. So now that that's kind of coming together, by adding that cocoa butter in there again, we're adding, we're adding in those flavors, those underlying flavors that are going to help to enhance us. Now you could turn around and make this as well with bacon. Like a lot of, a lot of chowders and stuff you see will have bacon in it. So what you would do is you'd put your bacon in first. You'd render out your bacon, get all the fat off of it, and then take the, the bacon itself out. You save that for later for garnish. And then saute off all your vegetables and then add in your flour. And you really change the complexity of your dish because you're getting that, that, that flavor into it. So we're going to sprinkle this with a little bit of that flour. And 
And this, you guys can see, the nice thing about what we do, you know, everything that I'm actually going to do up here today is available in the cafe for you guys to taste. Um, we have a South American station. For those of you who haven't been into the cafe, we basically represent foods from the Western Hemisphere. The great thing about what we do this week is because it's all chocolate. And, you know, South America and Central America represent chocolate. So we took one station in the cafe and we completely changed it to chocolate. So every item on that menu has chocolate in it. Most all of them are in a savory dish. So you guys really get to try some different stuff. Anybody that saw the demo yesterday realized that we did a, um, we did a white chocolate and rabbit braised, or white chocolate empanada with braised rabbit in it. Um, and that's actually over there for you guys to taste as well again today. But again, it was incorporating that white chocolate into our, um, into our masa dough and then taking braising our rabbit down, some of the cocoa nibs, a little bit of red wine, some duck fat, and then pulling that and making an empanada out of it. It's phenomenal. It really is. Um, now that this is getting, getting pretty, pretty good as far as that goes, I'm going to add in our corn. Probably about, it's probably about two cups of corn um, for this stew. This stew will probably make enough to feed probably six people very comfortably. So now that our, our corn goes in, I'm going to deglaze with just a little bit of wine. I'm not going to do like most chefs where we drink it first and then put it in. We'll keep it back for later. <laughs> I'm using a Chardonnay, but you really could use pretty much any wine you wanted to. It doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, you could, if you had a Pinot laying around or anything like that, a, you know, Pinot Gris or anything. You just want to use a white wine because you don't want that color. Now you guys can see, now you can see almost how thick this has already started to get. That's because that roux is already doing its job. And what a roux does is it's basically just a thickening agent. So it's going to start to thicken our soup for us. And what we're going to do now is I'm going to add in my chicken stock. So I've got my chicken, or my fish stock. And like I said, you could use, even though you're doing a fish soup, if you couldn't get it, you could do, you could use a light chicken stock if you didn't have it. Your best bet, though, is to get some bones from, the, from your local market and then really just cook them down. It really takes, it only takes about 45 minutes to make a nice, a nice stock. Basically, it's just uh, carrots, onions, and celery, a little bit of bay leaf and peppercorns, a little bit of white wine. Put it all in a pot with cold water to cover your bones by about a half an inch. Turn it on high until it starts to boil, then turn it back and let it simmer for about 45 minutes tops, and then strain it out and you're done. You've got a wonderful fish stock that you'd be able to use. So it's really not difficult. A lot of it is just the planning stage of what goes on. Now, now that I've added that cold stock, I want to mix this around, because what will happen is when you're cooking and you're using a roux, a lot of times if you add cold stock to a hot roux, you get what they call, we call in the kitchen, a roux balls, and you'll see them, they'll float to the top. So you really want to be mixing this around and stirring it as you're putting it in, because all that's going to do is help bring those flavors together. It's going to incorporate that roux, and we can let this come up to a boil. Now that we've got that in there, we're going to add in our potatoes, and all we've got is just regular diced potatoes. Got a little bit of water I'm going to dump off of them, just so they don't turn on us. I'm going to add in our diced potatoes, and everything's just a very random dice here. There's nothing that's, uh, you know, done at, you know, very large or, you know, extremely large chunks. And what we want to do now is we'd let this simmer. Now, we could turn around any of those, those fish bones that we cooked off. If there's any fish still on it, we could turn around and put that into here. And then we could use that as well inside the soup. But what we're going to do is we're going to garnish your soup with um, a cocoa-dusted salmon. And then, like I said, a bacon coconut dust, so uh, our bacon chocolate dust. So I'm going to show you guys why this is cooking, how we would go about doing that. So if you guys want to keep an eye on this for me, just kind of stir it around every few minutes. All right. So. All right. And our corn cobs. We can't forget about those. And all they're going to do is just add a little bit of that underlying corn flavor into our stock. They'll actually leach out some flavor as it goes, so you'll get to taste some of that stuff. You guys want to give that a stir? All right, so now we're going to work on our salmon. Let me switch, I'm going to switch sides with you, Tara. Hold on one second. Boom. All right, so now we're going to work on our salmon. So what I've got, a nice piece of wild salmon that we bring in here. All of our salmon comes from our um, the Quinault Tribe in Washington State. Get a good shot on that one. Um, the Quinault Tribe in Washington State. 
And we buy, you know, it's not farm raised, nothing, none of the salmon we buy is farm raised. You know, really trying to, to give the best that we can. And they actually freeze salmon for me year round, so this way I can actually use wild salmon throughout the year. It, it's truly a, a much better t flavor and taste in the salmon. I mean, anytime you can eat fish, it's a good thing in general, but when you can buy sustainable and, and wild, it's definitely worth it. Um, to that, I've got a little bit of cocoa powder. I've got some ground up pasilla chilies. A little chipotle chili. And what I'm going to do is we're going to make basically a rub that we're going to rub our salmon with. So I'm going to take our bowl, a little bit of that cocoa powder, a little bit of chipotle powder. And chipotle powder, everybody knows that chipotle is just a smoked jalapeno. A lot of times you see them in the cans, but they actually make a powder that you could buy. And it's phenomenal. It's got a very nice nose on it. It gives you that smokiness that you're looking for, but it really gives you a lot to go with it. I've got a little bit of pasilla powder. Pasilla are smoked ancho chilies. You can see it's a little bit darker red, rich color. You know, again, it's going to give us just a little more complexity in the dish that we're making. So just a little bit. You can see I'm not adding a lot of those chilies to it because I don't want to overpower it. I just want enough to be able to give it another, another flavor or something else. Again, underlying, building those flavors. Do a little bit of salt and pepper. And I've got a little bit of allspice that I'm going to break up here and we're going to put in there. See, everybody thinks you got to have all these fancy tools around the kitchen. All you need is a great big knife and you're good to go. So now this we'll turn around and we'll mix up. And basically all we've got here is basically like a cocoa dredge. And all we're going to do is we're going to use this to kind of dust our, dust our salmon. So I'm going to take my salmon. Pull this piece down here. It's starting to boil. And I'm going to take the skin off of it. I'm going to show you guys real easily. You can leave the skin on because the skin has a lot of nutri nutrients and stuff like that. It's great for eating. But I'll show you guys you can take the skin off. It's going to be a little bit difficult because of the... Actually, you know what? Let me see. I'll switch over to this table. might be a little bit easier to see. I apologize for those. Ah, oh, perfect. So then what I'll do is I'm going to take my big old knife, kind of go down until I hit that skin. And I want to angle it out, and then essentially just want to run along that skin. And essentially all I'm doing is letting the fish kind of do the work. You can see how with my, my left hand, I'm kind of just wiggling the fish a little bit. I'm really holding the knife still at about a 45 degree angle, just letting it run along, those, along that skin, and then essentially pull it off. And you can actually pull that, the skin right off. You can see how it comes out actually fairly clean and everything else. In this instance, like I said, you could do it with the skin, or if you got a fish that had you know, a scale or something on it, you, know, you could turn around then and take it off. It wouldn't, make a big, it wouldn't make that much of a difference. So I'll start heating up our pan. The key is whenever you're cooking, you want to have hot pans. You know, a lot of times you see cooking shows or you start cooking something and you'll notice that it'll stick in your pan. It's because your pan wasn't hot enough. So you want to get your pan nice and hot. Now this is going to be a garnish for a soup, so I want to do probably about you know one inch cubes or so. So we're going to turn around and I'll cube this up. That'll be enough for what we need for our garnish. While that's going, you want to put a little oil in my pan, Tara? I've got my cocoa powder. Yep, squeeze it right into it. So I've got my cocoa powder. I'm just going to kind of roll my fish around in it. You can see I want to get a nice coating on it. So you can see I'm going to pull these out so you can get a good look at them before they go into our pan. And we just use a regular cocoa powder. Um, like I said, you could use a Dutch press cocoa powder, which just is a, you know, adds alkalinity to it or just, you know, does something. It basically adjusts the, the acidity in the cocoa powder. You can use a natural cocoa powder as well. Just depends on what you had and what was available, but either one would work well. 
All right, so our soup's coming up to a boil. So I'm going to put this back. You guys want to put that over there for me? All right, so I'm going to let this get nice and hot first because I want to get a nice crispy sear on that fish. Our soup's coming up to a boil, so we're actually doing real well there. You can see now that this is starting to boil, how it, start, how almost it thickens itself up with it. It's getting a little bit thicker. As it starts to boil, it'll cook more. It'll thicken itself. The, the key with using a roux, anytime you use a roux in anything that you do, you need to bring it up back up to a boil. Once the roux goes into the soup or your stock or your sauce or whatever you're making, you have to bring it back up. You want to boil it for about three to five minutes because that's going to be able to get, that's going to cook your roux out. A lot of times if you, you do it on stuff and it, the, um, you don't cook the roux out, when you go to uh, taste it, it'll taste almost give you like a flowery kind of aftertaste. It's because the roux wasn't cooked out. So we've got a nice hot pan here. You can see smoke coming off of it. We like smoke in the kitchen. Contrary to popular belief, we're not burning the place down. So I want to just get a quick sear. Now this, I really don't even want to cook this through all the way. I want to cook this to about a medium rare, maybe medium. Because remember, we're going to add it into that hot soup. So as you start to eat it, it's going to open up and that soup will finish cooking our salmon for us. And it'll help add and impart some of that flavor. Now this was a salmon stock that we did use. Since we break down all our own fish, we, use, we utilize the stock itself to make it. So I'm going to do about, you know, you can see it's not a very long. It's probably about, you know, maybe a minute on each side. You see, you can, you know, you guys smell it up here, raving and tear. You can see how that cocoa gets a, gets a nice little caramelization to it. How it gets a nice little brownness there on the top of it. And that really that cocoa goes well because the salmon's a pretty rich fish anyway. It's a very oily fish. So the cocoa adds a lot of flavor to it and it actually works real well with it. So that's probably about, you know, two minutes or so. I'm going to put that back on our plate up front. Believe me, if you didn't like eating medium rare salmon or medium salmon, you could cook it well done. It wouldn't hurt it. You just, uh, you just don't, to me, you don't get as, uh, as good a flavor out of the fish. All right, so now that that's done, let me put this back here. I'm going to work on our bacon dust next. So to make our bacon dust, we're going to use a, we're going to use molecular gastronomy. So essentially what that means is that we use tapioca maldextrin. If you notice this, it really looks like a light little flour puff. It looks almost like flour, but it's, tapioca maldextrin and essentially what that does is that allows us to incorporate oils and it turns those oils into a powder so it absorbs a lot so we're able to use that it's a that is basically a, just a, a byproduct off of a plant off the plant so it's a, it's an all natural ingredient that occurs every day in nature so it's kind of interesting and fun so then what we're going to do native americans use that in all their cooking by the way i just i'm just kidding they never really use that in their cooking but <laughs> So what I'm going to do is take about four strips of bacon. And we're going to render that bacon down. And I, like I said earlier, like if you wanted to do this for your chowder, you could. You're going to take this, uh, take that bacon, and we're going to cut it just into to probably about half-inch pieces or strips. And all we're going to do there is we're going to go right into our hot pan, and we want to render that fat off of it because we want that fat to make are uh, to make the dust that we're going to make. So you can see our soup's boiling up here very good now. And you can see how much thicker it's actually gotten. I don't know, it's, it's probably hard to tell, but you can see it's actually gotten a little bit thicker now as it's been sitting. So what we would normally do is this would turn, we'll turn around, lower the flame on this. And we'd let this simmer for about 35 to 40 minutes, depending on... Uh, how much time we actually had before service. Normally everything gets made ahead of time, so it would all just depend on that. You guys have any questions so far about anything? I'm sorry? Three in one day? You need to come work for me. I got my guys could barely make two. And that's with me yelling at them, so you're pretty good. The, the nice thing about what we're doing here is it's really to, to, to start thinking about chocolate 
outside of the traditional sense of chocolate and what it is and what the flavors are and how you can incorporate them differently into your everyday cooking. You could turn around and do, you know, maybe sear off a piece of chicken in the same kind of rub and then do a red wine chocolate sauce that would go over top of it by essentially just reducing red wine, you know, with some with some mirepoix and then adding in a veal demi, demi to it and then finishing it up with some chocolate. Now we wouldn't want to, in the sense of doing that, you, would, you want to think about the, the flavors that you're building and how they work together. So we wouldn't want to use a, a regular chocolate because it's going to sweeten it up and it's going to make it taste funny. But if we used a bittersweet chocolate, we can use that bittersweet chocolate then and turn around and make something unique off of it and incorporate chocolate into it. The Mayans and the, the Incans actually used to make uh, moles, and moles were the first traditional barbecues. And those barbecues, or those mole sauces that they would make, almost always could, had some form of chocolate in them. Whether it was the cocoa itself, whether it was the actual, you know, the plant or anything like that, but they always had, they always finished it with chocolate. So it's, it's unique that it's really been used for a long time in cooking, you know, not only just like you said in the sweet, but in the savory as well. So now you can see what we've got here is we've got our bacon fat. And now we wouldn't want to throw that bacon away because that bacon's still good. We can use that bacon. So we're going to want to take, I'm going to set this to the back so it'll cool down a little bit. Once that cools down, then we can start making our, uh, we can start making our dust. And we're going to use this big bad boy to make our dust. This is our uh, industrial strength food processor, the RoboCoo that we call it. So in kitchen langu language, you say the RoboCo. So I've got our tapioca maldextrin. I'm going to let that bacon dust, that bacon cool off just a little bit. I'm going to add in our tapioca to this. I'll start spinning this a little bit. And then I'm going to add in just a little bit of our cocoa powder. Now we can melt down chocolate and use melted chocolate in here, but we, can, we want that natural flavor of the cocoa to come out. So I'll just put just a little bit of cocoa powder into it. Yes. Yeah, this is a, it basically a food processor. We call it a RoboCo. It's an industrial size for the kitchen, but it, essentially it'd be just like one of the kitchen aids or anything you'd have at your house. It's got pretty much the same settings, pulse on, off, and all that kind of stuff. It's usually these are mainly used just for chopping, but we could do a lot of different things with them. Just like a great big one. That's all. All right, so I've got a little bit of our bacon. I'm going to take and pour just some of the fat into our bowl here. So we've got just a little bit of our bacon fat, and you really don't need a lot. I'm just going to let this cool down for just a second. Use my, my water back here. As a chef, we find out real quick, we find a lot of quick ways to, to have fun and unique things to do in the kitchen. This is one of them. You know, just working with what we have. We're, we, we, we get thrown into a lot of situations, whether it's in catering or stuff like that, where we need to be able to, to make items work and work pretty quickly. And by doing that, it really works. Now we're, we're about a decent temp. What it is, is if you add hot, hot liquid to that tapioca, it'll actually seize up. It turns almost to like a gum paste on you. So I need to let it cool down just a touch before I add it in. Just about there. So, so now what we'll do is we're going to turn around and we'll turn this on. Why it's turning, I'm just going to incorporate just a little bit of our, uh, our bacon liquid into it. Our bacon love, we call it in the kitchen. Right, Miriam? Miriam loves pork. All right, so now we'll get all that into it. And I'll show you how it kind of comes out. You can see, you know, that was probably about three ounces of, or so of liquid that we, or yeah, probably about two ounces of liquid that we put into it. And you can see how it comes out, it actually comes out to a perfect dust. And it's got the cocoa powder, you got the cocoa smell, you can smell the bacon in it. So we're going to use this as a garnish for our soup. So let's see, I'll put this up, put some in here for us so we can see it. All right, so we've got our soup. Pretty well, like I said, we'd really, in reality, it needs to cook for a little bit longer, 
But for television's sake, we're going to finish it up now and kind of show you everything. So I've got one of my handy dandy bowls here. We've got our soup that's cooked and seasoned and ready to go. I'd want to finish this up with just a little bit of salt and pepper, but you can see it's definitely a nice chowdery looking soup. I like my chowders a little bit thinner, just because I don't, just to, it's a personal preference, but if you like it thicker, you could definitely thicken it up a little bit more. We've got our salmon that we've already seared off in the cocoa. We'll drop a couple of those nuggets in there, usually about three or four. And I'll show you on the salmon, like even with just the time that they've sat and kind of sat here, you can see that they're pretty much cooked all the way through. They're, these are about a medium. So like I said, as they go into that hot liquid, that hot liquid is actually going to carry over and finish that cooking. Then we've got our chocolate bacon dust. We'll do a little bit of that right on top. You can see as it melts in there, it kind of gets that nice color. And if you wanted, just for a little, little bit extra, we've got that bacon that's still left. We can garnish with a little bit of that bacon as well. Now you've really got a nice soup. You can see, you know, reality, that probably needs about another 15, maybe 20 minutes to cook to get those potatoes completely done. But if you wanted to speed up the process, you just make your potatoes a little bit smaller, and you'd be able to make it work. So that's our uh, cocoa-dusted salmon chowder with the chocolate baking dust. There you go. All right, so now we're going to work on our... Um, the aioli, and we're going to do the, uh, the, grilled the grilled romaine. So what I've got is I've got a grill plate back here. I'm going to start getting warm on our fire just so we can uh, grill off the romaine. And we're going to make that aioli. So what I've got here is we've got a big blender, just a, bit, you know, just a, just a straight blender. It's a, ro it's a Vita Prep blender, which is a, a lot nicer because what happens with these is that most blenders, as they get worn out, you notice that gear will wear out on the bottom. Well, this is actually a gear that fits in, so it's a, these are usually a lot better to use in the kitchen. I've got my roasted garlic, and I've got a little bit of my roasted garlic oil, and I'm going to put that right into our blender because I want to puree that. I'm just going to give it a, a couple quick pulses just to, just to blend it a little bit. I'm going to take and move our soup. And I'm going to turn around, I'm going to melt down some chocolate. Now the interesting thing about when we melt chocolate, chocolate can be melted a couple different ways, you know, but you really want to look at, you know, the double boiler method is usually the best method of melting chocolate. The, the idea is that you use the steam to heat the bowl to do it. You could do it in a microwave, in a microwave safe bowl, but even then you, a lot of times you'll get hot spots. If anybody's ever melted chocolate and got a drop of water into it, what happens? It seizes up, right? Well, what that is is because cocoa butter and water don't mix. It's like oil and water. So what happens is, is that's what seizes up. The water it reacts with the cocoa butter and it tightens it up. Now you can fix that by adding a little bit of vegetable stock, a little bit of vegetable oil to it, not stock, but oil. Um, and then you can thin it back out and you can reuse it. So it doesn't necessarily mean you've got to throw it away, but it does change what happens to the vegetables themselves or to the chocolate itself. So make sure your bowl is clean and dry. You know, usually, yes, do you have a question? Oh. Double boiler um, system, so we've got a nice clean dry bowl here. We're going to wipe out, make sure we don't have any water in it. I'm going to add a little bit of white chocolate to it because, again, we're making a white chocolate aioli. So we never want to melt chocolate over open heat. Chocolate burns at a very low temperature. You can actually burn white chocolate over steam. You know, because the melting point is so low. So it's interesting, it's interesting to note. So I'll show you once I start melting this, how we melt it down. I want to bring my water up to a boil. Once I get my water up to a boil, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll finish it up. What we're going to do right now is to make our aioli. So aioli is essentially just a garlic mayonnaise. So we're basically making a white chocolate garlic mayonnaise. All right. I'm going to melt down a little bit of cocoa butter as well to use. because we're going to use that as we would some of our oil. It'll give us a little bit of nice flavor. Now, what we want for our, for our aioli is we want the egg yolk. We don't want the white. So I'm going to get two egg yolks. 
So we go, got one egg yolk in there. We'll get our second egg yolk in there. And then we're going to put our lid on. We'll start blending. I've got a little bit also of uh, Dijon mustard. And what, what we're doing with that is the, the Dijon mustard is basically we're making an emulsification. We're making a blend. So that'll help to keep it blended together. You won't necessarily taste it, but it just really helps bring everything together. So now I'm going to put this on low, kind of get that started blending. While that's blending up a little bit, I've got my cocoa butter going. I'm going to melt my chocolate. I'm going to turn my heat off now because I've got enough steam coming off of it that I don't need to add any more steam to it because chances are it'll mess up or I can burn my chocolate. I'm running out of equipment. Ah, oh, perfect. Here we go. So you can see how fast that white chocolate starts to melt. And once I get it to where it goes about halfway, I'll turn around and I'll pull it off just to make sure that, it, again, that I don't get it too hot so it doesn't burn. You know, and it melts fairly quickly. Now in the kitchen we use, most of the time we use the chocolate coins or the pistoles because for us, back in the old days, like when I first started cooking, we used to use blocks of chocolate and they were like, you know, five, ten kilo blocks. And it was ridiculous the amount of time it would take to have to chop those up with a knife. So nowadays for ease of service and ease of use in the kitchen, you know, most of the chocolate purveyors are now making these chocolate coins, making something a little bit easier, a little bit nicer for us. Makes it a lot easier. Now you can see it's pretty much melted already, so I want to pull that off now. You can see how fast it really does melt, you know, with just a little bit of heat from the bottom. You one of you guys want to come stir this for me? All right, so now back to our aioli. So now in our here, we've got just a little, there's two egg yolks, the roasted garlic. I've got a little bit of my... Uh, Cocoa butter that I'm, I'm melting down. I'll do just a touch more because it's a big pan. I could switch this out here. I've got a little bit of oil, so I'm going to start incorpor slowly incorporating oil into this, just nice and slow. I'll crank my heat up, or my, my uh, speed up a little bit and it'll start to thicken itself up and then essentially it'll start to turn into a mayonnaise. And you notice I'm looking inside of it because I want to see that emulsification start. If it starts to break then we'll be in trouble and I'll have to start all over again. I want to set off any fire alarms in here today. Never done it yet. They tend to get mad at me when that happens. Alright, so now coming together fairly well. I've got a little bit of lemon because we're going to add just a little bit of lemon juice to this for some acidity. Yep, that's good. Tara, can you get me a cup with just a little bit of water in it? And I'll use a little bit of water to thin this out. Each egg yolk will hold probably about four to five ounces of, of oil. No, yeah, that's fine. We're going to thin this out with just a little bit of water, so if it starts to get a little bit too thick on us, make it a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit easy. Now I've got my cocoa butter. You can already see, see, see how it got too hot. It's already smoking, so I don't want to put that into it yet because as hot as that bu that butter is, it will actually cook our eggs and we'll end up with uh, scrambled eggs and and uh, garlic, which wouldn't be very good for us. So I'm going to let this cool off just a touch more. I'll take and add just a little bit more to it. That'll cool it down for me. That'll help cool it down some. And this is just, again, to add a little bit of that flavor to it because this is a, just another way of incorporating some of that, uh, that chocolate flavor into what we're doing. So now I'm going to add just a little bit of this oil to it. Again, very, very slow, just a little bit at a time. I'll look inside to see, make sure it's getting incorporated completely. All righty. I'm going to add just a little more water to it to thin it out some more because it's fairly thick. And what we want to use it for is we, gotta, we need to make it a little bit thinner. There we go. Add 
That's good. Now I want to take a white chocolate. Can you hear me that white chocolate, Rave? Covering because it splatters up just a little bit. That's all. So. All right. So now we've got our white chocolate that we melted. That's going to go directly into it. You guys are all looking at me like I'm crazy right now, right? Trust me. I am a professional. All right. So now our white chocolate is incorporated into there. It smells like garlic and chocolate. It smells wonderful. I'll shut that down. So now I'm going to come back over here to my grill. And I'm gonna, we're going to get our romaine together. I know we're getting a little bit tight on time, so we're going to pick up the pace a little. So we'll get that nice and hot. And all I'm going to do is, if you want, Raven, you can squeeze one and a half a lime in or a lemon in here for me. And now I'm going to go back to our romaine. So what I want to do is I've got just a head of uh, baby, well, not baby romaine, but just um, romaine hearts. I want to take a little bit off of that bottom just because I don't want that big core on there, but I want to leave enough on here to be able to hold this together so we can actually do our, our, our thing. Now, you could turn around if you're making this at home. You could quarter them just like I'm doing right here just for uh, because it's a, it's a pretty big head. But you can see you get them in the quarters like that. Now, from here, what I want to do, I'll put them into a bowl. And I'm going to take a little bit of our oil. I want to get some oil on them because I want to, because again, we're going to grill them. A little bit of salt and pepper. And everybody's thinking, what do you mean grilled romaine? But it's, it actually makes a great, great salad because the grilling actually adds a nice flavor to it. So now I'm going to let my, my grill plate get nice and hot again. And I'm going to turn around and we'll get these down on the grill. And again, you can get to try all of this today because everything that I'm doing right now is available. You can try it all for lunch today if you'd like when we get done the demo. So while that's grilling, let me clean off my table real quick. Grab one of my plates. And again, you could do a plate like this, and that way you could serve it to, you know, a bunch of guests, or you could have it set up as a platter. Now, so my romaine's grilling off there. I'm just trying to get a little bit of marks on it. I wouldn't want to leave this on for a ton of time again because we are dealing with lettuce. We don't want to wilt it down completely. You guys want to tear it around and put that into a cup for me? Pour that in here. Yep. And then I've got some white anchovies. So we're going to garnish this with some white anchovies. So again, we're talking about you know South America and what they would have eaten. Anchovies were very big. Yeah, you can put it on. Just turn it on for a second. Perfect. All right, so now you can see we're getting a little bit of grill marks on our lettuce. That's what we're looking for. The lettuce has still got some body to it, so that's, that's good. I'll take this first piece, lay it down. Our second piece. Now you can see how our aioli came out. By adding that water to it, I was able to thin it out a little bit because I want to be able to use it to go over top. I'm going to take another piece of our lettuce. We'll go this way over it, the lettuce. And then I'm going to take some of our aioli and I'm going to kind of just drizzle it right over the top. We're going to kind of just go over the top with it. This is basically like a, a salad dressing, so we're essentially making a, you know, a salad in the sense that we're good. Where'd my anchovies go? Right in front. And then I'm going to take a few of our, our, our fillets of our white anchovies, and I'm just going to lay them out. And we want to flip them open so we see that skin, so we see that, that nice fillet of that anchovy. off. And then voila, so you've got a grilled romaine, white chocolate, aioli with, with white anchovies. So again, something quick and easy that you guys can do. Just to prove that it's good, I'm going to give these guys a taste. 
So you guys don't think that I'm crazy. Do you see their face? They didn't go, ooh, so was it good? <laughs> so that's the telltale sign when you can convince kids that it's good. Um, we're running out of time now, so what I'd like to do is just open it up. If anybody's got questions about anything or if, if there's any, anything that they'd want to know, you can see even here, I mean, that romaine's been on there for a few minutes. We've got some nice color, and it really holds up real well. You wouldn't want to do this with leaf lettuce. You wouldn't want to do this with like a bib lettuce or anything. You need something that's kind of hardy. that has got a nice, nice vein going through it that you can actually use. But you can see, I mean, it really, really holds up well to grilling. Do a grilled Caesar salad like that, it's phenomenal. You could do like a, a crouton, like a Parmesan crisp or something like that with the white anchovies. You can do a broken down one like that. It turns out real well. Some questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, white chocolate in the sense that it's only cocoa butter, sugar, and milk fats. When you get into the bitter sweets, it's, there's more cocoa than there is the other ingredients. So a 50% would be basically 50% cocoa butter and 50% um, cocoa powder. Where you get into the 74, it's 74, you know, 20, 26 or whatever the difference is. So that's really how you get into those different, when you get in those bitterness. When you get into like the 80% and stuff like that, the really, really bitter, because there's more cocoa powder than there is anything else. So there's less sugar, there's less everything that goes into it. You had a question down front? Yes, ma'am. You could, do it. you could do a pan as well if you didn't have a grill. The grill is just nice because it gives you a nice effect. You can actually do it on your grill outside if you had an outdoor grill. You know, if you did this over like wood chips or something to give it some smoky flavor, it would actually be, it would, it would even enhance it that much more because those, an, you know, most people look at anchovies or, you know, and they go, ooh, I don't know, I can't eat them. But I can tell you that they're not a very fishy. The white ones that are packed in oil are phenomenal. They're the Spanish ones. They're not like the traditional ones you would see at like the supermarket. So if you get a chance to try them, you definitely should because they really add a nice flavor to something that to, and a lot different than what you would normally think. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. You could. You could, you could do that same dredge sear it and bake it in the oven and do maybe a fruit salsa. You could do, you know, you could do a poblano and cocoa nib salsa where you take those cocoa nibs, crack them up, do some charred onions and poblano, fold some of that in, and then do a garnish with that or do a, you know, a topping with it. It would be really good. You could do, you could do a, a red wine bermonier or a red wine butter sauce that you could finish with chocolate that would go extremely well with that too. But you want to use, again, going into that bittersweet chocolate, not, the, not like the 50% couverture. You want to get the, the stuff that's got a little, little bite to it. Yes? Are these recipes online or in your book? Uh, none of the Mexican hot chocolate that you guys will get to try on your way out is. Um, unfortunately, none of these are. The book was written, you know, prior to. And most of the time when we do these, are all, they're, very, they're one offs. If I can, I'll try to get them on the website. It's just been very busy these last couple of weeks. So I'll try to get them up on the website and we can see if we can get them out to everybody. Swiss chard would probably work real well. Kale wouldn't because it takes a lot longer to cook it down. Um, but a Swiss chard is something you could get a lot of heat on real fast and be okay with it. Any other questions? I think I saw somebody. Yes. Savory chocolate, there's not a lot out there. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't even know if I know of any that are out there. If so, I just haven't seen them or I haven't really looked for them. Um, but there's a lot of chocolate obsession is a, is a very good book for like chocolate lovers. It's all desserts, but it's, it's, it's a very good book. Yes, in the back. Essentially, it's just a traditional. We use the Mexican chocolate, and then we use some chili de arbol and cinnamon in it, and then we cook it with milk and essentially blend all that together. So it gives you a little bit of spiciness. It gives you some of the sweetness from the, from the cocoa itself. So you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. You could, just a little more roux. So essentially, even if your finished product still needs to be a little thicker, if you made a small roux, you can whisk some of that into it and you would be okay. Yes. No, you can you can incorporate them. You just got to get a ba figure that balance out. 
Um, you can see even the cocoa powder that I use, the, the dredge is a predominant cocoa powder with very little bit of the other chili because that other chili is going to get hot and you're going to get the heat from it. So you, you just got to figure out the balance and what you feel comfortable with. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes. It doesn't affect the flavor of it because all you're doing is adding, you're basically fixing that broken. It will, it'll, I mean, I would imagine it'll dilute it a little bit, but you're only going to need a few, you know, drops to really bring it back to life. So you're not putting a ton into it. The other thing that the vegetable oil works good for is if, if you're trying to use like a, uh, say it's a, not a great grade quality chocolate that you want to do, like a chocolate dipped strawberries or something with, you know, even like the Hershey's and stuff. You know, Hershey's, what they do is they use different, you know, where traditional chocolate should just be cocoa butter, cocoa, sugar, and some milk solids, depending on the company. A lot of times what they'll do is because, like these cocoa, the cocoa beans themselves are about $12 a pound. The cocoa butter is about 25 So it's really expensive. So a lot of these companies that make a lesser quality chocolate, that still tastes as good, but they'll incorporate different soluble fats into it so they're not using just straight cocoa butter. So what it is is um, you can add a little bit into that as you're melting it and you can still use, use it. It's just not quite as good as like a Valrona or you know, some, something along those lines. Chef, it's actually noon and we have to wrap it up. All right. <laughs> so if everybody could please thank Chef Richard Hetzler for our presentation today. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for coming. Please check out the rest of the stuff going on in the museum. Like I said, lunch in the midst of time if you haven't had it. We're at two and a half stars that got rated, you know, cafe. So we really do, you know, stuff like you're going to see, like you saw me make today is in our cafe every day. We really try to go above and beyond and change the sense of what museum dining is. So if you get a chance to stop by, we also have a new um, Cafe Espresso or Mitsutam Espresso, which is our coffee bar that you can get different lattes and stuff there. And we use tradi uh, traditional native coffees from the Americas, but also we're buying from a native source in, there in North Carolina. So there's some, some nice bl flavor blends over there. And we do the, the white Mexican hot chocolate and a, and a regular hot chocolate over there. So if you like white hot chocolate, that's the way to go. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Enjoy the revisit.